We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. These words from the Declaration of Independence are familiar to many of us, and yet it took 143 years for women to get the right to vote, and 189 years for black people to get the right to vote. And still today, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness are still only words for many people. Here in Boston, Life expectancy varies by 30 years, depending on where you live. In Roxbury, with many poor and black people, life expectancy is 59 years. In the Back Bay, wealthy and mostly white, life expectancy is 91 years. It's tough to have liberty when you are in prison. The United States incarcerates 716 people for every 100,000 people. Our rate of incarceration is more than five times higher than most countries in the world. Millions of people in our country don't have health care, a decent job, good education, a home they can afford, and that makes it pretty hard to pursue happiness. So on this show, you are going to meet people who are making it possible to have life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. People today who are making the words of the Declaration of Independence come true. Hello, uh, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm happy to be the host of We Hold These Truths. And today, we're very honored to have with us as our guest, Jean Dubois, longtime veteran organizer and executive director of at least two community development corporations. Jean, welcome. Thank you, Michael. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your background and where your values came from to become an organizer and a social justice leader. Well, um, I think it came fr probably growing up as a granddaughter of a minister, hmm. a Presbyterian minister. My mother eloped with my dad. The, she was Irish Catholic. And so um, they didn't speak to her until my brother was born three years after that. Uh, so there was tensions there between the Catholic and Protestant stuff. Um, and that was always an issue. My granddad, the Irishman, was so exciting and he always made things happen. Mm. But he didn't go past high school. Mm. But he made money and even bought strips of airplanes. I mean, fields of airplanes after World War II. He wow. was in construction, his old wow. uncle's company. Hmm. So that somebody like him didn't have anything beyond a high school education, but said, when you're building bridges, you go down to the solid rock. Hmm. And none of his bridges ever washed away. So that's an example of the kind of what I call cowboy entrepreneur missionaries. Hmm. That's my background. So the, there's something about going for it, going out west, building things. They hit a dinosaur, I mean, not a dinosaur, a, um, a rattlesnake nest in the mountains when they were cutting, you know, how the railroads, they were building railroads too. <clears throat> and um, they blew up this, this cut and there were like a thousand um, rattlesnakes flying through the air. Oh my God. And, wow. and with stories like that, he was exciting. He right. always knew he was going to bring a good story. So, so how did you get into organizing? Tell us a little well, bit about I that. Well, I was a teacher in Wisconsin where I had gone to grad school and, you know, a feminist. And it was this, the late 60s. And the teacher thing was all through the 70s. Mm -hmm. But I met the Alinsky people in Chicago when they came and were trying to help the teachers get a little more political in their and who, who was that you met from? Well, uh, Arnie Groff was oh, well. from New York, and he was an organizer with the Alinsky sure. Network. So I really liked him, and they said, well, if you're trying to organize people, what are you doing hanging around with teachers in <coughs> school rooms? You might as well come down to Chicago and check us out. So I did, and I really liked what I went through for them, uh, just a shorter training time. But then... They had me go to Buffalo, where I took a leave of absence from my teaching. And um, even my teaching is sort of similar to my granddad, where, mm. you know, we broke a lot of rules. You know, we'd, we'd have all kinds of speakers. We even had the, 
the people that were the leaders of the Attica Revolt back in New York, way back in the early 70s, um, prison revolt. And, um, and we'd have, you know, gay liberation speakers. We'd have uh, women doctors and, um, you know, all kinds of unusual people when we look at what is normal and what is mm. abnormal. <laughs> so I was accused by one guidance counselor of um, messing up the kids. You know, he said, you're messing them up. And I thought, well, he said, if you feel that way, why don't you go burn all the books in the library? <laughs> uh -huh. Well, that, I guess DeSantis must have learned that lesson. So. Right. So tell us, I know we met in... Uh, 1980-81 at Mass Fair yeah. Share. Tell us a little bit about how you ended up there and what you've learned over all those years in organizing. Well, I worked with the Alinsky Network for two years in Buffalo, wow. and it was a life-changing experience. Yeah, how so? Well, I think people in Madison <clears throat> did a lot of talking. I mean, they were good people, and they were trying. There were those who went and started working with unions, and mm -hmm. you know, reg and I was organizing with the teachers too, but. Um, it was all kind of verbal, and the real organizing, um, I, I didn't see as many results, and I felt like we needed to learn more about how do you actually pick something and mm -hmm. change it. So that's what I think they taught me. And I also felt that there are a lot of limousine liberals, as, as people mm -hmm. would call them. Not everybody, but you talk a good line, but that doesn't mean you're... Mm -hmm. able to make change. Mm -hmm. And I think we all had that to learn, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what it was starting with short-term, immediate, specific, winnable issues with a target, all those things that are like smart goals. Um, and just working with regular people in Buffalo, these were blue-collar people who had nice little houses and raising their kids and working, and that was a steel town. It was a lot of U.S. Steel and other companies, um, but a lot of people lost their jobs there. And poor Buffalo, it was really in the dumps. And um, But now it's actually booming. It's getting gentrified, which is the other problem. So tell us, what were some of the issues or actions you did back, that was in the late 1970s? Yeah. Yeah. It was like 78, 79. Yeah, what were you actually doing then? I was organizing with, we had 42 churches in something called, um, I, I forget our name, United Housing, no, no, mm -hmm. I forget the name of it. Okay. But it was an Alinsky-affiliated um, organization. And we'd go to meet with other people organizing around the U.S. And um, so, I mean, it was a two years of really learning and we could pull off 2,000 people in a convention and make progress. We got 42, well we had 42 church members, mostly churches, and we had some union people. And we got a lot of slum landlords to either clean up or tear down their bad properties. And they were also buying properties up and down the future rail line in mm. Buffalo that was going <clears> to <throat> take people right out to the suburbs where Somebody with influence or people had gotten University of New York, SUNY, Buffalo, mm. located out there. Right. So it was, there was a lot of corruption there. And the guy that used to run the um, United Way was a member of the mob. And even the mob was pretty active there in Niagara Falls. I was just there four years ago and during big storms. And... Um, I went on a tour of Love Canal, yeah. and <clears throat> it's still burbling. They fenced it off, but uh, people are living, literally living, right near it. And right. um, the mob runs that town, or did. Right. So, so fast forward a little. I know you were in Massachusetts, and you started well, no, I, Project ACT, yeah. the, well, Massachusetts, the forerunner of the Greater Boston Organization. Yeah, I went there. I, 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 I knew Heather Booth, and we talked about their network. And mm. I, I felt in some ways that I needed to try an alternative. Mm -hmm. And my dad died, so it was a mm. tough time. But um, I, think, I think just going to Boston and joining Mass Fair Share, where I met you, yeah. um, again, 
I was assigned to Rosendale and Hyde Park, and I'm still there. We bought a house there, raised our kids there. And again, it's, what's nice about that neighborhood is it was working class and middle class people, a lot of uh, Greeks, a lot of Irish, a lot of Italians. Not too many people of color, but now it's 50-50 in Rosendale, and Hyde Park is 73% people of color. Mm -hmm. So it's actually very interesting now and, and more vibrant, I would say, because mm -hmm. the people that really had issues around race probably left, you know, mm -hmm. and the people that were still here uh, stayed and they're enjoying their neighbors. So, and that my street where I live is like that. And we've had our, we'll be going on our 32nd block party in a row. Wow. Yeah, this year, next month. So, yeah, I've kind of fallen in love with the neighborhood, and I worked there with Fair Share, and then, again, I felt to use my experience in Buffalo with all the religious community, we started something called Project Acts, yeah, the Association of Churches yeah. for Training and Service. And we got the Greek, Orthodox, Catholic, and Protestant folks together. We didn't have any synagogues yet. But uh, now that, that literally metamorphosed, morphed into Greater Boston Interfaith right. because um, I left after I had my first kid and um, and I think I think Lou Finfer helped he stepped in uh, at that time mm -hmm. but um, I think then when the IAF kind of came back the Alinsky Network and I always admired them so we helped get different churches to support mm -hmm. the kickoff. And in my own church, Hyde Park Presbyterian, my granddad was a Presbyterian minister. Mm. Um, we were one of the co-founders co and we're still members. Right. <laughs> so that was, I don't know, it's been a long time, like 20 plus years, 30, right. 30 years. And, and do you have any lessons you, you think they're important from those years? Well, I, I was mentioning earlier about my four-point theology. Yeah. Obedience, risk, power, and joy. That if you're obedient to that calling that is in your heart, mm -hmm. in your soul, um, listen to that and act mm -hmm. on it. Mm -hmm. Then you take a risk usually, like starting Project X or going to work for fair share. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you do that, taking that risk, you are sent power in the form of people and money. Because what I learned from the Alinsky Network is organize people and organize money is power. Mm -hmm. And so when people have it, you win things, then you have joy. So, and I've used that over and over and over again for myself. Mm. I say my prayers each day. I, you know, I'm not a Jesus freak. I just feel that a faith community is helpful. And now mm -hmm. I belong to a church with about 40 members and five of us are white, and the others are all Jamaican or African. Mm. And uh, it's a great little church. It actually has more life and vitality, though it's small, than it used to when it was like 20 old white people like oh. me. <laughs> no, that's great. And then uh, I know you worked for many years for Dorchester Bay Economic Development yes. Corporation. How did that transition and switch well, happen? Well, the key was the Rosendale Village Market. Mm. We needed a supermarket to be an anchor business. And this was just all volunteer. I was on the board of Rosendale Village Main Street. Mm -hmm. And uh, my son was a baby. and mm. I didn't even have the second kid yet. But... Um, we organized over 600 families wow. and raised over $80,000 and went to foundations and got a purchase and sale on the property near the old market. It was mm. a it was a, dying, a dead market. Mm. And, um, and the people that bought it, we asked them to sell it to us and then rip it down so we could use the two parcels. Um, but that was a real experience because that was my first experience in actually building something mm. and um, organized people and organized money. And it wound up becoming an anchor for the Rosnell Village Business District. Wow. And it's, it's been a success. It was business of the year in 2018 on mm. its 20th anniversary. But we needed a supermarket like that. Sure. So, 
and we didn't want it to be a big chain or have just a lot of salt and fat. We wanted a healthy food, so there's mm -hmm. a good mix of organics. Of course, every store is that way now, but we wanted to make sure it was. But that is what got me into Dorchester. Mm. I got a call one day, and the board was looking for an executive director, and they heard about the work we did on the village market. And um, I went for an interview, and they, entered, they offered me a job. I had wow. been working during those years raising money for the uh, what's now called Blue Hub Capital was a Boston um, Community Loan Fund. Sure. Yeah. So BC, Boston Community Loan Fund. And I was there nine years and raising, or eight years, and raising probably... By the time we left, we had, by the time I got there, we had 400000 of capital raised to make loans to groups who were doing affordable housing. And when I left eight years later, we had about um, $8 million, maybe $7 million wow. in capital, and it was below market. And uh, that's, I think, what Dorchester Bay was looking mm. for, is somebody who's not afraid of raising money. Right. And... Um, it's also about organized people and organized money, right? So then going to Dorchester Bay, EDC, you know, we had 300 apartments and home ownership units. And um, by the time I left 20 years later, we had 1,300. You know, wow. the, the last 300 were in construction. <clears throat> but, and then we also built two big $14 million factories. Mm -hmm. Uh, digital printing, because the people needed jobs, and also the, what's now very famous, the Commonwealth Kitchen, sure. used to be the old Pearl Meats building. Right. And that one was fun because the Jewish families used to live in that area and then slowly, you know, hemorrhaged out, you know, good old real estate speculation and, you know, all that. The rabbis, the book, Hillel Levine's book, when mm -hmm. they were throwing acid at the rabbis and, you know, vandalizing their synagogues. It's just such a hideous story. But um, I, I think, um, I don't know, it's all that is about obedience to a calling, I think. Mm -hmm. Whatever, whether it's a religious one or a political one, that voice inside of us. Mm -hmm. And now I'm reading a book about the tradition. It's called Anam Kara. Hmm. which is Gaelic for soul friend. Hmm. And the guy that wrote it, his name is O'Donohue, and he's dead now, but he wrote it about 25 years ago. Hmm. But his concern is there's not enough soul in what people are doing. Hmm. But in Ireland, in way back in Irish tradition, hmm. and my mother's from an Irish background, there's this sense of the belonging to the land that's a very strong thread in Ireland. Mm. And you're near the sea. And, you know, there's not a lot of wealth there, or there wasn't. Um, but that's my great, that's my granddad's history. His family came mm. over during the famine. Mm. So I, I think the Irish tradition is don't forget your soul. Mm. Let it drive you, because that's where the creative stuff is. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's where that obedience thing came from. Yeah, so what's it saying to you, Jean? says, find more people like us. Mm -hmm. And I've found a number. In fact, I'm very close friends with a woman named Adriana Cillo. She came here as an Italian, couldn't speak English, went to uh, St. Thomas Catholic School in Jamaica Plain, mm -hmm. was harassed by all the non-Italians, mm -hmm. mostly Irish, I'm afraid. But she wound up uh, being harassed by a bunch of mean girls, and she actually slugged the leader. And she has that kind of spirit. But mm -hmm. she also learned from this nun how to speak English. Mm. So she's one of my closest friends now. Mm. And I spotted her when I was an organizer with the churches. She helped win a footbridge so the people who lived in her area could get across to Hyde Park Avenue and catch right. a bus. That's something you're really good at. <laughs> uh, spotting people. How, how do you do that? Because I know you've spotted Felicia well, Richards and other organizers. Felicia is a good example. Yeah, no, I'd like to know, uh, how do you spot people? Uh, well, one, they don't have to talk all the time. 
Mm -hmm. But they're smart and they're not afraid of talking. Mm -hmm. And Felicia was one of our tenants, still is, mm -hmm. in Hyde Park. And when they were looking, we put together this big coalition of four CDCs initially. Now it's just three because the one I'm at a pan didn't continue. But when we won this big Kresge grant to work on climate change and with local mm -hmm. activity, uh, as well as state um, state legislation, um, we were looking for organizers. Mm -hmm. And we watched Felicia. She was the chair of our organizing committee at the CDC, the Community Development Corporation. So our CDC started in 2001, it's now over 20 years old. This is Southwest Boston. Yes, that's what I run now. Yeah. And what bothered mm. me is they had 30 units, 35 units when I got there. Mm. And now we have 95, wow. four years later. So, you know, we just got to get moving. We had a private guy that would loan us money to put down deposits. Mm -hmm. uh, but Felicia is a good example of she would run the organizing meetings and she she was clear about steps to work on something mm -hmm. you could win and and she treated people right she mm -hmm. didn't bully people right and uh, there's a lot of verbal leaders that just bully people right and one of my best friends who's irish immigrant she's like that too she's really she's clear she's strong she has confidence but she's not a bully and right. she has a huge family all around yeah. her. Let's talk a little bit about the development. You've built these houses. Now, we're in Boston, where there's this incredible housing crisis, little apartments, triple-deckers that used to sell back in the day for $30,000 are now $2 million. It's a ridiculous. single apartment is $600,000. Right. Uh, what have you learned in all those years of development? What's going on here, and what is possible Outside to do? Outside speculation and corruption and cozying up to various politicians. That's what it's all about, people making huge money. And I think it's a war, and I'm happy to be a part of the war. Well, what's effective? I mean, you've done What's effective is we were buying houses. I, I have pictures that yeah. we can show you. Uh, the, the smallest ones were three-deckers. The biggest one was 26 apartments. But we were just buying properties as much as we could you know, in the last four years, so now we're up to 95 apartments. Right. Well, what's it going to take well, to really solve this problem so people who aren't gazillionaires could actually live in Boston well, and I buy a house? Well, I think part of it is organizing people and money. Mm -hmm. So the good people, like all of us, need to cooperate. Like up and down the Fairmount train line now, we've got a lot of affordable housing built either as home ownership or rental. And what does it take to build it now well, that's, to allow it to be affordable? Well, the key is the city gives us a subsidy. Okay. So where somebody else would have to, you know, I can't remember. I think the smallest property we built or we bought was three-decker, and mm -hmm. we paid seven ninety nine for that one. And then we had a four-family. We paid 900-something thousand for that. But that, the prices were already going up, but now it's almost double that stuff. It's right. crazy. And my own kids, if, if I hadn't gotten a three-decker in 1981 for $31,000, right. we could all afford those. But that's where my kids have both lived, you know, without right. paying anything. So what does the city or the state or the federal government or people have to do to, uh, to solve this problem? I think... I think the CDCs are one important vehicle because we know we have experience buying, building, and also we built uh, 27 new apartments right before I got to Southwest, to Hyde Park. So the community development corporations. They play a role, but you need to be working with your organizing groups because they get bogged down in the details sometimes. And you can't lose your vision or your outreach to the local neighbors any project that we worked on in Dorchester, we'd always go out and see all the neighbors first. What do you think? We worked closely with Dudley Street Neighborhood Initiative, you know, as Peter, what's his name's uh, old group. Mm -hmm. um, but they're good. They're, they're, they're always focused on the people in the community having a real voice and also making sure that all the different ethnic groups have 
even roles and, and balance on the board. Mm -hmm. Can you s describe any stories or what's effective in doing that and who the opposition is? Well, I would say the main opposition, well, the stories of the CDC's winning, helping win with the community organizing groups. So we were, had two big coalitions mm -hmm. all the way up and down. And so even New Market Business District became a part of that. So right. there's Fairmont Indigo Transit Coalition, which the organizing groups right. kind of led that. And we, but they were doing organizing that the CDCs you know, couldn't cover all of that. So there was more power that way. And we won the $200 million to get uh, four new stations on the Fairmount train right. line. Right. That's a big win. That's a very big win. Then we kept organizing, and still are. We got the fares lowered to MBTA level. Right. The, the Boston Public Transit. And then there was, uh, we won um, more trips per hour and weekend and evening service. Oh, that's great. And now we're working on electrification. Right. So what are the lessons, if you would look back on really what's 50 years of organizing, what would you tell people are the lessons you've learned and what's necessary for people to, uh, to win are the kinds of things? Don't that stop. And always use the four steps. It's you know there's my uh, my uh, theory, my my yeah, philosophy. No, say it again. But it's yeah. no. But here's the four steps of organizing that we just talk about. One on ones, you got to go listen to people. House meetings, people will form a group like Lawrence Community Works. Would just have groups just so that people could get to know each other. Mm -hmm. These house parties, and then they'd have a first Friday where the leaders of those groups would share learnings. Mm. And do you know from those little things, they have gotten more than 20% of all public, of all housing in Lawrence being affordable. So we're only at 13% in Boston. That's outrageous. Mm -hmm. It's outrageous. Cambridge, I think, is up to 20%. Right. Secondly, you, so you're doing your one-on-ones. You, then you have your house parties. Then people pick something that's short-term and winnable so they get experience winning mm -hmm. whether it's a supermarket or uh, you know in Buffalo we had a dirty supermarket and we got it cleaned up we Correct. didn't have to build one mm -hmm. but um, and then so one-on-ones small groups group research you go down find out <clears throat> who's the decision maker on such and such a short-term issue eight to ten week long issue mm -hmm. I had high school boys from the public housing in Rosendale going down to meet with the parks commissioner about the pool that had been shut down by Prop 2 and a half way back. Yeah. And we, all the churches worked on that in Rosendale, and we won. You got a pool. We so won the Flaherty swim. Pool. Oh, that's and great. the kids, but they were a part of that. And when they came out of that meeting on the research trip with the parks commissioner, they went up to this TV guy that was filming somebody else and said, do you want to interview us? We just met with a commissioner. <laughs> right. If there was one thing, because we've got to end now. Yeah. If there was one thing that you would like to tell younger people getting into organizing and social justice, what would that be? I think everybody should learn it. it it's not just civics. It, mm -hmm. If you learn these things, you will be successful in anything you try. Because it's always about relationships. It's about following a vision that you all agree on. It's shared vision. You're learning to do research, you're learning how to work with small groups, and you're learning how to negotiate and win on things that are small and then huge, like thank the you. rail line. Yeah, thank you, Gene. These are real things. So we just uh, want to thank you for listening. Uh, our guest today, of course, was uh, Gene Dubois, now the executive director of the Southwest Boston Community Development Corporation. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Again, my name is Michael Jacoby Brown, and I'm your host for We Hold These Truths. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the next thing. Thank you very much. Thanks, Gene. Okay, it's great Michael. to have you here. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thank you.